we actually have a, a pretty full schedule. So uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to the uh, College of Engineering, uh, Purdue Engineering Distinguished uh, Lecture Series. We're very pleased to have here today as distinguished lecturer, uh, one of our very own uh, uh, Professor Christy Anseth of the University of Colorado. Uh, but uh, before we do that, let me remind you that after the uh, lecture uh, today, there is also a panel. Uh, this will be held in the Henson Atrium uh, right after the conclusion of the, uh, of the lecture. So without further ado, let me uh, introduce our uh, Dean of Engineering. Uh, Professor Meng Chang is the John A. Edwardson Dean of the College of Engineering. Uh, his research received the 2013 Allen T. Waterman Award. His online courses and textbooks has reached over 250,000 students, and he co-founded several startup companies and a nonprofit consortium. So please welcome uh, Dean Chang to do the introduction. Thank you, Sang, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, such a pleasure to be here at the first of spring semester Purdue Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. We launched this about a year ago and bring in some of the very brightest minds in engineering across the country and the world uh, to Purdue Engineering. As part of our aspiration to achieve the pinnacle of excellence at scale. And today's distinguished lecturer, welcoming her back to the Boilermaker land and also a uh, personification of what pinnacle of excellence means. And Professor Christy Anseth is the Tassong Distinguished Professor of Chemical and Biological Engineering at University of Colorado Boulder. And she is a graduate from this very school, the Davidson School of Chemical Engineering. Uh, and her accomplishments uh, will take about two hours to describe, at the very least. Uh, we're here to listen to her, so I will abbreviate that by highlighting that Professor Anthes is one of the very few engineers in the nation who is a member of all three national academies. National Academy of Engineering, National Academy of Medicine, I guess at that time it's called the Institute of Medicine, and the National Academy of Sciences. All three at the same time, and actually at uh, uh, a younger age than, I would say, some of the other uh, uh, handful of individuals who are engineers elected to all three academies. Uh, that perhaps uh, is the shortest description length, the uh, summary that I can find uh, to describe uh, the fantastic achievement by one of our uh, best and brightest alum. And also, she works at the interface between engineering and medicine. And as we explore the future for the whole College of Engineering, including the great Davidson School of Chemical Engineering, that intersection is immensely interesting. So I'm looking forward, Christy, to your distinguished lecture uh, talking about the soft material for hard biological problems. Thank you so much and welcome back. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, well, um, thank you for the kind introduction and it's certainly a, a pleasure to always come back and visit Purdue. Um, I have to confess, I first arrived on this campus in 1989, so it's been 30 years. Um, but I've had many occasions to, to come back, and it's always a, a pleasure to see all of the uh, exciting advancements, all the new things going on in the School of Chemical Engineering and beyond. And um, what I wanted to tell you a little bit about today is how uh, chemical engineers, bioengineers, material scientists engineers are uh, needed to converge together and come together and be able to solve problems in biology and medicine that can be really impactful to society. And uh, what, what I hope to convince you today is give you a little bit of a snippet of some of the, the ways that we've been interested in this area. Um, 
And so the first is um, to maybe provide a little bit of context. Um, so we're very interested in how we can design material microenvironments here, represented by the, the, the yellow strands or scaffolding, that can interface with living cells. So cells in our body reside in a tissue microenvironment or a material microenvironment. And we're interested in culturing these cells, placing them in these three-dimensional environments. And in an application standpoint, we're interested in coaxing these tissues to reform tissues that could, in this case, repair or re regenerate tissues in our body. And this happens to be articular cartilage um, that's on all the ends of our bones and it allows us to move our joints without pain. Um, we started working on this problem almost 20 years ago um, and it took about a decade to get these into human medicine, but cartilage is one of the tissues that, that we can regenerate and repair as an alternative to total joint replacements. Um, but as the field moves forward, and as we began to also think about and tackle even more complex problems or questions, um, sometimes we don't know all the information that's necessary. What signals do we need to give to the cells to recreate or, or reform tissues that might comprise multiple cell types or need a blood supply or a nerve supply or have a particular metabolic function? Um, so in that instances, we sometimes look at and think about material microenvironments and designing ways to track cell function in real time so we can understand this outside in signal. And if we can understand that, then we can begin to coordinate complex events and begin to, to tackle even um, harder problems that, that exist. Um, and so in this spectrum, my own group has worked with many different types of material systems, and one that I want to talk to you about today is one that I first learned about as an undergrad at Purdue doing research in a laboratory, and that's the picture here of these uh, macroscopic picture of a hydrogel. So a hydrogel, if you could see the molecular level features, you would see long macromolecular chains that would normally dissolve in water, but because of interactions between those chains, it renders them insoluble. And instead, they imbibe large amounts of water. And when they do that, that makes them very interesting systems for placing living cells in. It recapitulates many of the soft tissue uh, microenvironments in our body. Um, when you put cells in these environments, they can secrete, and the signals that they secrete to talk to one another can rapidly diffuse through this in environment. Um, so we use a lot of mass transfer <laughs> principles and under understand that, as well as some of the mechanical cues that cells get and the three-dimensional structure cues they get from this environment are very reminiscent of what biological cues would be like within our tissues. So this is just a picture where we've uh, given the cells a fluorescent label that they uptake, and then one can also visualize these and, and use lots of advanced imaging and quantitative image analysis to understand how cells respond to these microenvironments. And so now the engineering comes in because you're trying to coordinate a complex series of events from the seconds after you assemble this to what happens days and weeks and months later as the cells began to remodel and recreate tissues, and also on different size scales, from a small receptor on a cell and how it binds and interacts with that material, all the way up to the size of a cell that might be microns uh, and cell-cell interactions and, and movement, and uh, eventually to, to a three-dimensional millimeter, centimeter structure that, that you're trying to recreate or repair. Now, there are lots of different chemistries that one can use to, to make these types of, of material and microenvironments. And so I'm just going to tell you about one that, that we've worked with uh, extensively. And it's based upon polyethylene glycol, or PEG. Um, this is the chemical structure of PEG. I uh, wasn't quite sure of my audience. Uh, 
when I was a young assistant professor, one of the classes that I was assigned to teach was general chemistry for all the engineers. And I'm a chemical engineer, so I thought this was a great class. It was really uh, foundational to a lot of engineering principles. But then I quickly learned that a lot of the double E's, the mechanical engineers, uh, they chose those pathways because they really didn't like the chemistry side of things. Um, <laughs> But you can think of this many different ways. But this is a very hydrophilic polymer. Uh, it's pretty unique in that this, these two carbons with this uh, ether linkage makes it a very highly mobile system. It has lots of waters of hydration. This polymer, synthetic polymer, is one of the most widely used in, in medical applications in human medicine. It's used to modify lots of drugs, and it influences their bioavailability and stability. So it's also very useful as a biomaterial. And we can modify the ends of these pegs with lots of different substituents so that when we dissolve this in water and suspend it with our cells, we can catalyze different reactions. It'll go a transition from a liquid to a solid phase and embed the cells in this, this microenvironment. Um, so we're interested in using this because of its historical application in humans, um, but also because uh, when we have this peg molecule, when you culture cells, you culture them in this complex milieu of many different components. Or if you implant it in the body, there are many different proteins that are present. And a lot of biomaterials get modified by nonspecific interactions of their proteins. And the cells see those nonspecific interactions. But when you use pegs, it minimizes that. So now, intellectually, when I want to start modifying my material scaffold, I can better understand that how specific interactions or chemistries that I put in influence the cells, and it doesn't get masked by those nonspecific interactions. So we started and we began a lot of our work with PEG, and when you begin to put cells inside of these, so while the PEGs are really nice, they form these molecularly controlled structures uh, that influence a lot of properties, cells do not recognize this chemistry uh, at, at all. Uh, so it's not something they inherently interact with. So when you put cells in these environments, they typically take on a spherical morphology. They're not interacting with the material. These happen to be the cells found in your cartilage, and that is a natural morphology for cartilage cells. So these types of hydrogels can be very useful for the cartilage tissue engineering example. It also promotes a lot of cell-cell interactions. And so some cells in our body inherently want to interact with one another more so than with the matrix, our material environment. And so this happens to be islet cluster, which is the islets, which are a cluster of cells found in your pancreas that are responsible for making insulin, and they coordinate together uh, to respond to different glucose together in a very elegant feedback control mechanism. And the cell-cell interactions and the size of that islet are very important to that. But many, many cells get important signals from the material environment. And here I'm just uh, showing one movie here. These happen to be uh, stem cells found in your bone marrow that when your bone breaks, they're highly migratory and they go to that environment and help with its healing. When you put those types of cells into these hydrogel environments, they'd like to attach, but they can't. They're secreting and making all kinds of proteins, trying to modify their environment, and it, it diffuses out of the material matrix. They're trying to move towards one another because they think they're in a wounded environment. And eventually, they undergo a cell death, a programmed cell death. Uh, in biology, we call it anoecus. It's um, a, a cell death because of lack of matrix interactions. So if we were to culture these cells in just a PEG environment, they would die in the course of a day or two. So we can begin to now think about, depending upon the cells I'm putting in this environment, what types of chemistries and signals should I introduce? And so one of the ways that we think about this is we think about going from our pegs, which are a blank slate that provide a three-dimensional structure to these cells, and perhaps some mechanical cues, to how do I begin to modify this environment to recapitulate some of the ways that the cells interact with, in our bodies. So they will bind to certain chemistries. There'll be certain linkers that they can degrade. It'll also store different types of cues that can be released and promote wound healing. And um, one of the ways that we think about this 
is when we design materials, we think, well, how do we make them dynamic? And one of the ways that we do this is on one hand, we think about trying to make our materials recapitulate the materials in our body. Cells naturally remodel and interact with this material, and we design different types of cell-dictated dynamic matrices, that the cell decides the changes that are all occurring. And then on the other hand, sometimes we want to be active experimenters, and we want to be able to trigger changes around the cell and watch how the cells respond to that. And that's something that allows us to gain some particular information about how a particular cell can coax a cell to move in a certain direction or to divide. So um, a lot of the work in my group, half of it is designing and interfacing new types of polymer chemistries and engineering them to promote these times of, of interactions. So some of this is a way that I can tell you about some of the chemistry that we're interested in. So we're going to start over here and look at how we design materials that mimic the tissues in our body. And one of the ways that we begin to, to do that is we take advantage of an emerging paradigm that's evolved in the chemistry field where they talk about different types of, of click reactions. So these are reactions between two species that occur with high specificity, even in a complex milieu. Um, these two <coughs> reaction partners will find one another, the reactions will proceed with high efficiency and quantitation without usually need for purification. And the bio-click reactions are ones that can occur in uh, living systems in the presence of, of cells and tissues. And there's a whole milieu of different types of click reactions and reaction partners that I can begin to think about using to modify my pegs. And so the idea is I can take different reaction partners and modify these end groups and mix and match different chemistries to introduce functionality and make hydrogels out of this. Now my own group has focused a lot on the development of this last one here. It's called a thiolene coupling reaction. So we use thiol groups and we react them with unsaturated enes. Now the reason we were interested in this is because it's one of the few reactions that you can use light to catalyze. And I'll show you some examples about how light can be particularly beneficial when making biomaterials because you have spatial control of the reaction as well as temporal control of the reaction. And so we take advantage of this thiolene reaction. So now we have to think about which thiols should I use and which enes should I use. And so we spent some time thinking about this. <coughs> and in the biomaterials community, one of the thiols that has been of large interest is an amino acid called cysteine. And so I'll show you that in just a minute. But when we began to think about modifying our peg gels and making them more like our tissues, uh, the, the biomaterials and bioengineering community has been very interested in incorporating short peptide sequences that are found in full-length proteins. Um, so these are peptides that can be synthesized on, uh, automatically on solid phase peptide synthesizers. We know a lot about uh, certain peptide sequences that cells will bind to. So if we think about a tissue, a soft tissue, it's water swollen, has certain mechanical properties, our hydrogel captures that. But when we began to think about other functions we need to incorporate, we need to put in functionality cells can bind to. Well, we know exactly certain sequences that will bind to those cell receptors. We know we want to put in sequences that a cell can degrade. We know cells make different enzymes, and we know which sequences are found in proteins that they degrade. Here's one that's found in collagen that will be cleaved. We can also screen through and sort of phage display our high throughput screen different peptide sequences that will bind some of the growth factors that are stored in the extracellular matrix with high affinity. This one happens to bind one called TGF beta. So we can begin to think about putting peptides into our, our peg gels to recapitulate the tissue environment. And uh, this is the way that we think about it and the reactions that we use. So we make peptides of interest, and we just include cysteine as one of the amino acids, so that's our thiol. 
Now, the tricky part about the, this style is that it's not as reactive as some other styles. So we had to screen through and find different ways that we could modify our pegs. And it turns out that this ring strained ene is one that is highly reactive with this style. So when I mix them together, they're stable over long time scales. But when I expose it to light, I can create a radical on this thiol that will propagate through this ene. And this forms a carbon-based radical that just chain transfers back to the thiol. And then it, this goes around. So one photon, I can get hundreds of different reaction events. So it's a very efficient reaction. But the important part about this is that I can make lots of different sequences here and control lots of different peg structures and chemistries. <coughs> so the idea is that I can use my peg synthetic component with different multi-arms, different molecular weights to control the physical properties of my gel. And then I can make amino acid peptide-based sequences that include cysteine, and I can mix in different amounts or stoichiometries of those components. And if I use robotic liquid handling systems, I can make arrays of biomaterials, load this up on a microscope that real-time tracks cell behavior, and then I can screen through different formulations that lead to the output that I would like to have for cells interacting with that biomaterial. And so let me just show you one simple example. Um, here, I take my forearm peg, I modify it with my norbornene, I make peptide sequences that contain cysteines, one on each end, so it'll link up into the network and form a crosslink. And now I put in those same bone marrow-derived mesenchymal stem cells. And now this is low magnification, so the cells are the small black dots here. And when I put in a degradable sequence and a binder, watch what happens. So as opposed to the cells being bound in the matrix and immobile, I can design systems that the cells are attaching and locally degrading through this gel and moving and migrating. And if I misspell my amino acid sequence and I change this W-tryptophan for, for an alanine, the cells can attach and bind, but they can't move and migrate through this matrix. So now you can begin to think about designing hydrogel material microenvironments that can be placed in injuries or in wounded environments where certain cells can infiltrate and move through your matrix environments and others can't. Um, I won't go into a, a lot of detail here, but this particular chemistry and its photochemical uh, activation allows spatial control of the chemistry as well as on-demand gelation. And so one of my uh, early PhD students uh, working on this, Ben Fairbanks, famously printed his image, took a photo, projected it through a microscope, and here's a, a picture of Ben written with fluorescent chemistry inside of the hydrogel. So it gives you an idea of the resolution that, that one can achieve. Um, one can also encapsulate cells within this environment and then use lasers or two-photon confocal microscopy to introduce different types of biological signals in different environments and then study cell cellular responses to those. So this can be important if I want to use these for different types of wound healing environments. I might like to deliver different molecules. And so I'll give you just one example of that where we're going to compare this material system where cells highly migrate through compared to this one which uh, the bone marrow cells can't infiltrate. And um, we are collaborating with a, an otolaryngology department at the time. It took me a while to be able to pronounce that, but otolaryngology sort of studies your, your head and neck and injuries to that. And so we had a, a medical uh, clinician who was interested in trying to get bone to regenerate after major fractures to the skull. So it's kind of limited the materials that they have to induce regeneration, but yet it's very important to be able to have regeneration occur quickly because the bone in your skull protects your brain. Um, so he had a model where he was creating uh, a critical size defect in, in the skull of a rat. You can probably see this easier here. 
Uh, it's about eight to nine millimeters in diameter. And then he put in, this is, he called it non-degradable, but that was that alanine variant that the cells cannot migrate through very well. And you'll see you'll get some, after nine weeks, peripheral uh, bone regeneration around the edges of the hydrogel that's implanted. But here, if we put in the, the degradable material that the bone marrow cells can infiltrate and have this three-dimensional structure of the hydrogel, we get a tremendous amount of, of healing that occurs after just nine weeks. So that's kind of interesting because we're just designing a material niche to mimic aspects of the extracellular matrix. There's no drug here. There are no cells being delivered. And it itself can induce healing. So the questions and some of the directions that this is going. So this technology and these materials have been translated to a, a startup, Mosaic Biosciences, who's partnering uh, to deliver different types of biologics that can be useful for accelerating wound healing and, and bone healing. And so some of the, the challenges are that this isn't perfectly healed. It takes nine weeks. So you can begin to think about what types of signals could I embed inside of these hydrogels that could cause faster uh, bone regeneration and, and, and osteogenesis? Um, so that, that's one part of the story about how you can design materials that allow certain types of cells to interact and remodel. Um, and I can engineer these with high specificity for particular cells of interest. Um, the next part I want to tell you a little bit about are how it can also be useful not just to mimic biology and watch and be a passive observer of how uh, tissues and wound healing and cells interact. But how can I actively intervene and use this and modify materials to, to better understand biological questions that, that will be important and direct cell function and fate? And so this is a, another type of chemistry that I want to tell you about, but I want to put it in the context of an area that's really growing in the biology field right now. And this is some of our, our work that, that we haven't published yet, so I hope you'll find interesting. Um, so in biology and medicine, there's a high level of interest in identifying and finding different types of stem cells that reside within niches of your body. And if I can, I, isolate those cells, can I grow them in a dish in a way that they'll reform all the different cell types that are found in the parent tissue? So that they're, they're called organoids, and here's just a little picture here where there's a, a stem cell that's taken from your intestines, and it's one I'll tell you a little bit about. It grows up into a colony, and then it begins to differentiate and form all the different cell types that, that are found in your, in your intestines with time. Um, so it's really interesting, it spontaneously happens when you culture them in hydrogels in a dish. Now, the value of these organoids are that they're defined to recapitulate much of the structure and function of the original tissue or organ that they came from. So people are really interested in growing these because now I can begin to think about patient-specific cells, uh, culturing them in a dish, and there's lots of promise for this in trying to understand the nature of different diseases from person to person. Uh, if it's the intestine or, or other organs that can be really useful for drug screening, so our intestines absorb many of the drugs um, that we ingest, and so they can be a, a model for, for drug discovery. Um, and in other cases, they can also be a source for trans planable tissue, if you have cancer or if you had a large volume of, of tissue that's injured or has to be removed. Um, so we're really interested in using our hydrogel niches to grow organoids. And I'll tell you a little bit about the intestinal organoid. Um, so just a tiny bit more background in the biology of our intestines. So our intestines, we think of them as a tubular structure. But if you were to see the uh, more microscopic details, the surface of our intestines have these ridges that are called a villus, and that's where a lot of the nutrients and drugs are absorbed. But where a lot of the action is, is right down here in what's called the crypt. And in the crypt, this is where your intestinal stem cells reside, these yellow cells here. They're also called 
LGR5 positive cells, and that's just a marker on the cells so you can separate them. Um, and they, they have these supporting cells beside them, but the, the main thing about this is that these stem cells in this tiny crypt grow up the crypt and they regrow all the cells, the epithelial cells on your intestines, and they do this about every four days or so. It's really dynamic tissue. And it's pretty amazing, that the turnover of the cells within our intestines. Um, and so it becomes this really interesting model to try to understand and develop. And I'm going to tell you a little bit. So the one thing you'll see are these intestinal stem cells. And you might hear me talk about these LGR5 cells. And the way this was discovered, and it was discovered in, uh, just a few years ago, is people took these LGR5 positive cells, they grew them into a spherical colony. And what makes the organoid, so it grows into this spherical colony, and then they have these little buds here. And these buds are what are called the, the crypts. So it's a little different. It's not a tube, but these organoids are spheres, and these are the little crypts. And then uh, you'll see different types of images. These you can't see so well, but you'll see that the, the stem cells go to the crypts, and they proliferate. Those are the ones that regenerate and, and make the whole organoid. So that's just a little bit of background. So, um, the reason we got interested in this and why we, we think it's an interesting engineering problem is there's great interest in using these types of organoids for looking at and screening for how our bodies respond to different drugs. But to do this and to grow all these organoids, right now all the biologists grow this in a material that calls matrigel. It's secreted and it's found in, uh, it's secreted by tumor cells, it's found in this basement membrane surrounding uh, these cells, and it has a highly variable composition. It's harder to scale it up if I need to make hundreds and thousands of organoids for drug companies to, to screen through, and the material itself isn't, isn't approved for clinical use. So we were really interested in designing material microenvironments that could be very useful, that I could make organoids reproducibly and uniformly and use a material system that would be uh, re systematically reproduced and useful for these types of, of assays. All right, so um, paper from a bioengineering group that we were collaborating with came out in 2016. So this was the only thing that was known about growing these cells in something other than matrigel, where they took these single cells and they're trying to grow them into colonies. And one of the first things was they found kind of this Goldilocks syndrome, was that if the material's too soft, the cells wouldn't grow very well. If it was too stiff, it would hinder their ability to grow into these larger spherical organoids. And in the middle, it was, it was kind of just right. So they could grow these cells, and they could tune the mechanics of their hydrogel environment for this. But then when they tried to differentiate them and form the intestinal crypts, what happened was in matrigel, if you differentiate them and give them the right cues, they form these crypt buds. But in these synthetic gels, even in the ones that were just right, all the crypts would be inverted, and they grow into the middle. And then the colonies would just die. So what happened was through lots and lots and lots of screening, the Lutolf group found out that I needed to start here, but then dynamically I needed the material to just soften and degrade with time right when I was differentiating it. And it took about three days for that to happen. So if they had designed a material that started here, and then they differentiate it, and they let the material soften, they could form these crypt cells. And these are just examples, and it shows all the different cell types that are found in your intestines. So they were able to recapitulate an organoid from the intestines in a synthetic material. But the thing about it was that if you look at these, and those of you in the front, if you can see it very well, is that they all have different shapes. The crypts have different sizes. And it's a fundamental question is, does form follow function, or does function follow form? And if we wanted to have and make these intestines we didn't want some that had 20 crypts, and some that had two crypts, and some that had big crypts, and some that had small 
Crips. So we got really interested in this. Could we design our hydrogel matrices? We'd already done some work, and we'd used some of our modeling from chemical engineering about kinetics and statistics where we could make materials that would just break down with time at a pre-engineered rate. They'd hydrolyze. Uh, and that's the, what the group, the, the Lutoff group did. And this kind of led to random type of organoids. Um, I just showed you some of the ways that we could let the organoids decide themselves if we knew what enzymes they were secreting and remodeling. So we could make materials like that. But also in our group at the time, we were designing materials that we could use light to also degrade the material and to change material properties and remove signals, not just add them in like we had done with the thiolene chemistry. So we had designed some linkers that could be cleaved with light and different wavelengths of light. So here's the pitch of this, the story. This is uh, the, the bottom line up front is that when you use these pre-engineered matrices and you tune it just right, you can get crypts to form, but they're very irregular. If you use the cell-directed systems, you can also get some crypts, but it's more complex and you have to add more different cell types and supporting cells. And that was one that was recently published a year after this work. So what I'm gonna show you is that with our photodegradable materials, we can design and grow these intestinal stem cell colonies in materials that are just right, and then we can come with lasers and pattern in and directly form the size, the shape, and the direction of the crypts. And we're very interested, again, in using this to make hundreds and thousands of, of crypts and using these for, for drug screening applications. So that's what I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna tell you a little bit of the story. All right, so, what we did here was we were already using our favorite peg, and we were using some of our different click reactions. Here's an alkyne that we were using that would react with an azide to click together and form hydrogels. But the one thing we were doing a little differently is we were putting in this nitrobenzyl ether group that we can photodegrade. All right, so we could put in different types of peptides, but now rather than cysteine, we'd have to put in azide functionalities. We could mix all this together. Um, we follow the gel forming using a rheometer, and we can monitor the stiffness evolution of the gel with time. And when we mix all these together, they react and they form a, a robust gel in, in about 10 minutes if you follow this with time. Um, so we model some of those kinetics, and then here's a picture we can follow the intestinal stem cells growing into colonies in real time inside of these gels. Then we recapitulate and we look at, so what happens? Do we also see this mechanosensitiveness when we grow these stem cells inside of our hydrogels? And so we embed them inside of these hydrogel matrices and we can tune and control the stiffness of our gel over a couple of factors. Um, we can watch the intestinal cells. Now this is a low magnification. Here's all the colonies growing. Um, and then we can look at the efficiency of which they grow into form colonies. And indeed, we see when we have a certain stiffness gel, we can have more efficient colony formation. And I'm just gonna show you some results here with, with this formulation. So here, here's the more interesting point. So now, once we have and grow these colonies inside of these gels, I can use different wavelengths of light and cleave that linker. So as I learned in my reaction engineering class, we could model and understand by how this linker absorbed light, how it would cleave, and with a laser we can control the scanning speed, we can control the power, and we can monitor the cleavage of this reaction just by following the absorbance of that molecule and whether it's cleaved or not. And so we look at that analysis and we can get at the kinetics of the cleavage. And what's most important here is it sort of follows a classic photochemical reaction, a first order reaction. But the important part is how, with this kinetics and the connectivity of my network, so uh, I had also taken a polymer class here, and the number of linkers, the statistics to form a gel, 
how many I have to cleave before it becomes a liquid again. It's no longer an infinite gel. And I need to cleave about 84% of the linkers. And so the end result is we can calculate how much of a light dose we have to have. 13 to 14 microseconds of a pixel dwell time. So that means as I'm watching my cells, I can go at basically imaging speed and modify the chemistry of the gel around the cells. So here's the image. Um, here's uh, the intestinal stem cell colony. I come with a 405 nanometer laser, and I'm just scanning in these two directions, changing the chemistry around, and then watch. And then the cells begin to go down into these degraded regions. And after 48 hours, they've almost completely filled the, filled the region. And I can do this to a whole bunch of the organoids, because it's microseconds to do this. And almost all of them grow into the regions that I've modded, so the fraction that form these crypts. So it's highly efficient and scalable. Um, but I've just shown you that the cells go down here, but which cells are they? And so this is where we have to do some more of the biology. And we have certain reporter cells where we can label the stem cells so that they express a green fluorescent protein. So those are the crypt cells. When we do this, we can show it's the crypt cells that are going down. The stem cells are going down into these crypts. Um, we can magnify them. And it's also interesting, one of the things that we recapitulate is we get a crypt cell, a supporting cell, a crypt cell, a supporting cell. And that's exactly what's in the tissue. Um, and we can show that they're also proliferating. So now I can begin to make hundreds and thousands of these organoids. Um, we can vision, uh, visualize them in, in three dimensions. You can see this elegant repeating architecture of the crypts. We don't pattern them. We don't change the gel. We don't see the crypts forming when we start to differentiate them. Um, and we can show also, uh, this isn't as important, but we can show that we get all the different cell types that are found in the crypt villus architecture of your, of your, epi, your intestinal gut. Um, all right, so the next part of this is uh, we can also begin to ask why and how does this form? So we collaborate a lot with biologists who are very interested in this, and now let me blow this up. So what's happening is you make an intestinal organoid. It goes from a single cell to an organoid that's pushing away the hydrogel and the hydrogel is pushing back in it. So think about a balloon that's growing, that's being blown up, and there's a force acting normal to it. And then I relieve it. So then what happens is the inside of the balloon we can see by this protein called F-actin. And when I relieve that stress, it causes the cells to stretch. And hopefully you can see some of this stretching. And that stretching leads to a mechanical signal in the cells, and that mechanical signal causes those cells to differentiate and form the crypt cells. Um, and so we're doing a lot of analysis of this and quantitation. I'll show you a little movie here. It's, it's quite dramatic that you see these shape changes. Um, so we had a spherical orange, and then just immediately after doing it, it quickly changes its shapes. It elongates the cells that, that are found in the, the crypt. So the distance between them get pushed closer together between the nucleus. And the, the length from the base to the apical side gets stretched out. Um, and so we can learn a lot about mechanisms as well. All right. So uh, this is some emerging work and very important work in the field of, of organoid biology. How can you make systems at, at high scale and reproducibly and making them in defined shape and functions? Um, so I think uh, I'll maybe just quickly give you a, a little bit of a, of a snippet of uh, one last class of materials that we're interested in. I told you some about pre-engineered materials. I design materials that they degrade or change at a pre-engineered rate. I can design systems that are cell-directed and cells remodel and decide. Or I can design systems that are user-directed, like the photodegradable systems. But an emerging class of materials in science is materials that become adaptable. And they have dynamic links between them, and they respond. And so I'll tell you a little bit about adaptable systems. And these are materials that you have links between the material, but the links go 
on and off. It's a reversibility uh, in covalent bonds. And so when you have that, you can pre-engineer the reversibility. That reverses at a certain rate, at a certain temperature or pH. Um, cells, when they push against it, it causes a force against the material and it adapts and remodels. And they can also respond to changes in external loads of mechanics or light and heat. So let me just tell you a little bit, we're interested in putting our organoids in these types of adaptable materials. Um, I won't tell you all that story, but I'll just tell you a little bit about the chemistry. So adaptable materials are really interesting because people are also interested in using them as bio-inks. So they can be adaptable, they can be ejected, and when they're injected, they can reform shapes and become solid again, so going from uh, flowing uh, to solid. They can be responsive, so they can print with cells as well. Um, and so they're useful for, for all types of applications with combining living systems with material systems to generate complex three-dimensional structures. So some of the chemistries that we're interested in, let's, let's just focus on this one here, where we use our favorite thiolene reaction, but we're going to design systems where the thiol reacts with the ene, and it creates a symmetric intermediate that will rearrange and regenerate the ene, and the thiol will be removed or kicked off. So in this way, you create a system that's very dynamic. Rather than a permanent link, I have links that can be rearranged in my system. Um, and so we, we make gels with these types of materials using our same azide cyclooctyne material. And I can react and form gels. And they form in a few minutes. So a very fast reaction. And now I put this allyl sulfide linker in there. And when we do that, this is the reaction that I told you about. We can exchange in thiols into this ene, form an intermediate that I can swap out linkers in my material. So this is quite interesting because I can swap out single thiols and break crosslinks in my material. I can add in more thiols and cause stiffening in my material. And let me just show you uh, one example of why this is really useful. I told you about this nitrobenzyl ether group. It absorbs light. And one photon leads to one cleavage event. Here, in this reaction, I can have a stable gel. And when I expose it to light, it can relax and remodel. And one photon leads to hundreds of events. So here, I'm following the modulus of my material as a function of a radiation time. And uh, when I have no thiol exchanging in and out, I get a small amount of modification. Um, but as I add in more thiol, I can adapt and rearrange my molecule to change the modulus. And when I add in more and more, I can go beyond the critical point that a gel is formed, and it'll go from a solid that's softening to a liquid. Um, so let me maybe just show, a, I know I'm going a little fast here, but we analyzed all the kinetics, so a good looking at light intensity effects, initiator effects. But, but the whole story here is we can coordinate and look at the kinetics of the, the cleavage and remodeling with light intensity, and we can compare that with what happens with our nitrobenzyl ether group and our allyl sulfide functionality group. So this is a very slow remodeling, and this takes fractions of seconds to happen. So we can begin to think about making organoids. So this is a centimeter thick gel. Normally, light wouldn't even penetrate all the way through this gel. And when I expose it to light with my remodelable, adaptable group, it completely erodes, and light can, can penetrate all the way down to the bottom in less than a minute. So I go from a gel, I expose it, and within a minute, I've gone completely to a liquid system. So we're interested in using these types of systems to culture our organoids in, forming their shapes and crypts and structures, and then we can recover by just exposing and capturing those organoids and using them or, or transplanting them. All right, um, I think maybe what I'll do is I'll skip through this last example and leave some time for questions. Uh, apologize for my time management there, but um, I guess what I wanted to tell you with and demonstrate with this talk was um, there's this great interface of chemistry, material design, 
that can be useful to create new types of systems that can interface with tissues in our bodies, with cells in a dish, and really be helpful to design systems that can enable injuries to heal in our body. So the hard biological problem in the first example was regenerating bone. The second hard example that I gave you was one trying to understand a stem cell and how it recapitulates and forms multiple cell types and spatial control of the information that's given that's important for directing all of these features. Um, I think there's a lot of advantages in using quantitative analysis to control and, and modify these environments. They can be designed in, in many different ways, um, but there's lots of opportunities and there's a really big need in the field. Um, so there are many advances in what we can do with cells and monitoring and tracking them in real time. Um, there's lots of advantages in chemistry and new design of materials and characterization of those materials, but there's a big gap at the interface. And we really need a lot of people that bridge those two technologies and engineers play a critical role if we want to understand at the system level and how we can translate this to, to useful technology for both medicine and pharmaceutics and, and, and for the basic biology community. Um, so with that, you know, I'd like to acknowledge that all of the organoid work was done by Tobin Brown and Ian Morozes, two recent PhD graduates, and we collaborated with Matthias Lutolf and one of his postdocs, Nicolce Jarovsky. Um, the earlier work on bone was in the thiolene reaction was a collaboration with Chris Bowman, Ben Fairbanks, who I showed you his picture, and Mark Tibbet and April Clarkson did, did a lot of the, the work on um, developing the photodegradable chemistry and Varsha Rao and Alex Caldwell are doing the work on translating that to some of the bone regeneration. And with that, I'd just like to really thank you for your attention. I hope some of you found different aspects interesting about what I had to say today, but everything that I told you about was, there was work of these individuals here. Um, they do all the hard work in the lab. I get to hear about all their uh, exciting results and discoveries, and I think most everyone's smiling here. Uh, they're a pretty great group to advise. I, I feel very fortunate to be a faculty member, and um, also a special thanks. You know, Purdue was a great place for me to kick off and learn about all the potential about what chemical engineering can do, and uh, it really encouraged me to take a path less uh, taken, and um, it made all the difference. So thank you all, and I'd be happy to answer questions. Well, as is uh, customary, uh, we uh, encourage our students to ask the first set of questions. Thank you. First of all, thanks for coming. Wait for the mic, please. First of all, thanks for coming to give a. Okay. Uh, thanks for coming to give an exciting, engaging talk and starting this discussion. Um, so obviously you worked a lot with uh, developing user-directed materials. I was wondering how you started to go through that process of designing these materials. Um, how do you delve through all the different types of chemistries and know how to combine them? Is there a trick to it or do you just have to sift through the literature? Yeah, no, that's a, a good, qu good question. Um, so some, some of what we do is um, we, we think about what has some historical use in a living system. So the photodegradable group that we use happened to be one that we were looking at a lot of the photocaging work that had been done, molecules that were internalized by cells and then released by photocaging. Um, but you know, to be honest, you know, I think it's, it's a little bit of a mix of rational design with perhaps some luck in reading the literature, and then some, I think there's also value in combinatorial screening in some cases as well. Yeah. There's a question there. Um, uh, hi. It's on. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for uh, giving this talk, it was awesome. Uh, I was wondering if you could speak about how uh, your work uh, could be used uh, for the purposes of biological computing and uh, biological storage. Uh, uh, so the question is, how could our materials be used for biological computing and biological storage? Um, yeah, I mean, that's 
something I haven't thought about specifically, but you could imagine trying to design um, material systems where you'd have changes in readouts or refractive index, perhaps, high information density that could be stored in a third dimension as well or layered. Um, yeah, so I, I think I would probably start by talking about a lot of people that are working on developing those, those types of systems, but um, good point. much. Um, I have two questions. Um, the first one is related to, you mentioned that um, this gel has to be um, worked or tested to, um, can help with like tissue regeneration for uh, the injury treatments. So I was thinking about, is this gel uh, capable to like mimic any uh, tissue injuries, such like, like uh, spinal cord injuries and brain injuries, since you said like the stiffness of the gel could be tunable. Um, the second question is, and the two types of cells you use in this, um, that in the work you um, presented were the bone marrows and the um, intestinal uh, uh, stem cells. So I don't, um, I don't, I don't know quite uh, sure about how those cells like um, they interact with the gel. But do you think um, some other type of cells, such as neurons, can be applied or cultured in this kind of gel? Because when the neurons are in, the, in their like, uh, embryonic stage of development, um, it requires some like tracks or glial tracks to migrate. Do you think this type of gel can like, reach that kind of purpose? Right, um, uh, so the first, the first question was, um, do, do our hydrogels mimic some aspect of a, a tissue, and maybe some of the changes that happen with disease or injury? Um, and I didn't talk about some of that work today, but that is one of the things that we've done quite a bit of work on, is culturing cells and making uh, tissues in these environments where you can dynamically stiffen or soften or injure the material and then watch the injury wound healing response. Um, and some of those studies can, are, are really nice models. I, I will say for things like disease, so um, in cancer, tissues get stiffer, and that's why you feel cancer tumors, or fibrosis, you have heart fibrosis, or liver fibrosis, the tissues get stiffer. And we can stiffen on our systems and watch cellular responses, but the time course of many of those diseases, or neurological diseases, is years, right, or decades. And sometimes it's harder to, to scale or figure out what's the time scale in our in vitro experiments that would mimic a really long time scale of a process that occurs over decades? Like, can we accelerate and mimic that in two weeks in a dish or not? Um, and then the other question is, yes, many of these uh, materials can be tailored for, for other types of cell types. So we have worked with neurons. You can change chemistry and, and, and develop tracks for axonal extension. We've worked with heart cells. Um, uh, so some of it is just kind of what's the biological question to tailor the materials to. Yeah. Well, uh, we do have another panel event, so uh, I would encourage everyone to attend the panel. And of course, there will be more opportunities for a Q&A at the panel. So let's thank uh, uh, Christiane. <laughs>